convenience them, you to plant seeds. So for me, when I realized that, and there were days when I would go in and I was stressed, and and I remember there was a time. Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome to and the, the second me, session said, for today. Um, teacher, so we've had we don't uh, smile two, as much anymore. Okay, uh, I can tell in that the you're really of, uh, um, February, upset you're have and, a lot and going more. through a tough so time. And uh, when my student told me that, I realized, um, um, and you these know, are the presenters, we, as I said before. The if presenters are from around the globe. We We've got try, presenters um, to from be the best Cyprus can be. on the left, our students do Portugal, notice. they do pick up United on this. States, and India, so I think it's really important Middle that East, we realize every single day UK, we have that impact. Italy, and the so United the things States. That, um, We've got Shelly here Lorac, today. We've got Ron from Canada, Japan, that. New Zealand, now, the reason why I've uh, Netherlands. Dr. Uruguay, originally book, from uh, I know you're a big fan. United Kingdom, um, but Canada, he United States, Mexico, risk. United States, and he Australia, Guyana, uh, Israel, all of his books, there's uh, an adventure. Greece, and, Malaysia, and the people who start do not have an and, easy time uh, in this South adventure. Africa. Um, so I we've got a lot of uh, presenters from around really the globe. So it's really exciting and, and, uh, and to be able to learn is. together start, different subjects, scary. different topics. Uh, it's not only about Moodle, but you can also learn to Moodle. So without further ado, and, uh, and, let's uh, and you begin. These, um, I'm not sure, Shelly, which the way. of the and slides you want to start with. You meet, so you tell me when you just give you. And that's what I like a lot about um, right. the Dr. Hello, Seuss. Hello, Shelly, and this, uh, welcome. So now that you realize, oh, that's I'm better. telling you now, <laughs> you have a mission is you are a teacher. And that makes you Shelly, I'm gonna one of the most important jobs because in the world. I remember you're impacting <laughs> lives. So you have, um, what are you going to do with your 3,000? What are you going to do with the 3,000 students that you impact? And, and if you teach online and you impact many more, like, um, like, like Nellie does, Nellie, you know, uh, impacts so many more, and other people that are here, Sylvia, um, their reach and uh, the students, the teachers and stuff they train, they have a lot more than the 3,000. So imagine what would happen if you inspired 3,000 individuals. Well, we have that opportunity to do that. So how do we do this? Well, uh, first of all, uh, a little bit about it. So the world, uh, the webosphere is is evolving. Every day, millions of us um, share the narrative of our lives. Um, we update our statuses on Facebook. We uh, share our pictures on Instagram. We pin things. Um, that we're interested, recipes, um, crafts, things like that on Pinterest. Our lives now um, are very, this is a ritual that we all practice in, parents, sh children, and this is the kind of we now live in. Learning has evolved. And, and even if we haven't evolved, maybe it's a little bit scary, maybe it's going so fast, and maybe it's so different than the way that we learn, we still have to understand it and learn it because that's the way our students learn. And that is something that's now in, in, in our society. So, um, and because of that, because we all are, are very open to, to sharing different things, things about our lives through social networks and even if you don't use it for um, teaching and maybe if you just share it with families or our friends you're still participating in those rituals and this is a worldwide ritual so because we do this the web and technology is changing to make this easier so what you need to understand when we first started with web 1.0 it was very much a one-way conversation so we couldn't do things like this we could basically create a web page with smiley faces at least that was my first web page that I created on Geos and you really couldn't talk with me you couldn't leave comments you couldn't like it anything like that we wouldn't have liked it because it had too many animated GIFs. So then we went to 2.0 and then we went to 3.0 and and when we go through these um, what it means is, is our communication. We can do a lot more with the communication and I think we should take some advantage of this. 
So there's different ways to have learning online. Your students have different opportunities, and you do as well uh, for professional development. You have things like this, webinars. Um, you have things like MOOCs and um, the Moodle MOOC, an uh, open online course where a lot of people participate. You have Second Life. Not a lot of people use that as much anymore. When I first started, I used to do teacher training. I used to train teachers on Second Life. And we used to um, have students on Second Life. I had a school in that virtual world. <laughs> um, you can have online conferences. You can have Google Hangouts, um, Skype ins, a lot of language teachers still teach through Skype. Um, you can have um, um, e-courses as well and other forms of... So that's my job. You might wonder who I am. Well, um, I am the curator of many, many um, award-winning projects, so I'm very, very proud of that. You can see my oh, oh, <laughs> education. <laughs> I, um, I got that this Hi, year. everyone. Uh, so I am you here for um, EdChat. So EdChat is one of those... Uh, platforms. Um, it's a Twitter chat and it's a way that you can learn. Um, the difference between webinars and e-conferences or hangouts, that's a good question. Um, hangouts are, okay, so hangouts are part of Google Plus. Um, Google is what I'm teaching with at the moment for my MOOC, it, which is we're all gathering together. There's over 500 teachers and uh, we are working together each of us is producing our own textbooks for our own classes in five weeks. Okay, so this is what we're doing right now. Now, on a Google Hangout, it's a lot like Skype. You can get on video, except 10 can get on video. So um, that's one of the things that you can do with a Hangout. The great thing about a Hangout on air is you can also go straight to YouTube um, afterwards. It records the session, so that's really wonderful. You can screen share, you can watch YouTube together. There's so many different things you can do there. Now, uh, when you have something like a webinar, it's a solo event like this. When you have an online, Melly has one coming up soon, which is the um, Connected Online Conference, CO14. So that's something you can look for. It's a series of webinars. It's a lot like um, we try to make it similar to what you would experience in a physical conference. So the one that I run is the Reform Symposium e-conference. We have about 5,000 teachers from 100 different countries. They do 120 plus presentations. We have text on. We have musical performances online. We had Steve Bingham, Jeremy Harmer sing. Uh, we had Jason rap for us. I mean, so that's with a conference. It's different because you're putting it all together and it's united usually under a specific theme. Um, we also learn through blogs and challenges and things like that. Um, so, so when you are teaching online and you are teaching through, middle, uh, through Moodle or any type of of online platform, you have the opportunity to get your students connected and, and to participate in these different types of, um, of learning opportunities online as well. And your students will appreciate it because many of your students are already participating in language community. For example, BUSU, um, if you teach language learners, BUSU to has millions of, of students there. So that's uh, something where they can continue learning as well. So you have the ability to impact millions. And with EdChat, the Twitter conversation, um, a reporter asked me around January um, this year to ask me what our reach was. In three days, we reach oh, um, nearly 2 million people. That's how far our Twitter chat um, messages that are posted and stuff like that reach. So to have that kind of impact and to have that impact as a teacher is simply amazing. And for those that are trying to make a living out of this who um, are still putting your foot in the door and you're still trying to figure out how to market your lessons and everything like that, that's something for you to consider. So if you think it's scary to get on Twitter or Facebook and all that, this is the way if you are, are trying um, to market your classes and get more students, then you should really consider doing this on social media because that's how you're going to get your potential students.
So what is the e a pedagogy that we're going to discuss? Okay, so you know your reach, you know the impact, and we're going to look at specific examples um, on how to put this into action as well. Um, but I want to go over the e-pedagogy that I've gathered, and it keeps growing because I keep reading more, and every time that I read more, I learn more. But some of the items that I've I found that kind of pop out from the books and stuff is um, collaboration. So there's the opportunity for your students to work together. And if you're running something with a, like a large community, it's important that we just don't give direct instruction like this. It's important that we provide community. And that's one of the great things about Moodle MOOC is when you go to the forum, I was seeing some of your messages back and forth with Nelly. And so that's a collaboration. That's where you're co-learning. So we're going to talk a little about co-learning later. Creativity. Um, and that's something that uh, Sylvia Guinan's here. And you should read her blog because she does so much with creativity online. She has her students um, learn through digital storytelling. They have projects. And some of the things they do is just really beautiful. So this is something that we can do. Your students can be creative online. And you can too. For them to make connections, we need to tie it back to why they need this instruction. Um, experimentation, we need to give them the ability to be able to experiment and play. Play is one of the most important things that Dr. Seuss talks about as well. Um, and then we have exploration. We want them to be curious. We want them to be able to, to figure out what it is they want. We want to be flexible to give them choices critical thinking. Um, at the same time, they have to feel as if they were challenged. And then the ability to have individual expression. So I'm going to show you some quotes, and then I'm going to give you some examples as well. Um, and one of the things that uh, um, Dr. Sue says in Oh, the Places You'll Go is he says there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you want you won't want to go on. And I know for many of you, that's something that when we start teaching online, we start teaching with technology, we are afraid. We come upon things, realize we have no clue, we have no idea. And I've been there before. I've taught teaching didn't know how to use their email. I actually was doing um, um, I was doing a session in Germany, and a lot of the teachers couldn't figure out how to access their email. They only had access um, their emails, their email accounts, while they were at teaching and at work. They never did this at home. So for them, it was it was something that was very very scary. So that's something that I think as well. But I want to encourage you to take some risks. And I want you to, to think about the way you teach and reflect on it. And think about learning in general. Now, I'm not going to be talking about PPP or task-based learning or kind of, because I want you to think differently. I, you know those things already. I want to introduce you to something different. Because what you've learned in the past doesn't work online. You can't teach the way that you teach in a classroom online. It's different. It's a different form of communication. So I want you to rethink the way you do online instruction and be open to new ideas. And one of the ways I, I've participated in a lot of online learning myself because I want to get better at it because I want my students to be more encouraged and I want them to walk out and really feel like they have a learning experience. And that's one of the most important things, whether you teach face-to-face, -face, blended, or you teach online, is to provide that opportunity where students at the end of your session or course, they should leave feeling like they had an experience, like you impacted them in some way. And that might be asking a lot, but hey, your mission is being a teacher. Impact lives. What you plant will will be in for, help them make decisions, will help them develop. So it's really important that we give them these experiences. 
Um, and one of the things that I ran into was Howard Weingold, and he's phenomenal. He's uh, written lots of books, and he talks about pedagogy and co-learning because you might be really scared right now and think, "Wow, I have so much to do, and I have no time." And trust me, I have no time either. I hardly ever sleep. So, um, any way that I can make teaching easier for me, I'm going to do, because I like to get sleep now, so <laughs> I realize I need it. And this has been phenomenal. Pedagogy, what it means is that you learn from your peers. Your students learn from each other, and online you have the opportunity. So when, you teaching on, when you're teaching online, um, if you let your students help each other, give each other feedback, and then you're going to help yourself because then you don't have to be the only person who gives every single learner feedback because that's, that's almost impossible online. I sometimes do it right now. Um, there's other times that I'm teaching 200, 100, and it, it's to provide them all with feedback and make sure that everyone feels like they have had um, somebody view their work and give them um, advice and things like that and they just didn't get a score is really difficult. Um, so it's really important that we give students the opportunity and the freedom and the tools to be a community and learn from each other. What that also means, according to Howard Reingold, is that they get to build the content and they get to shape the curriculum. In other words, you're not the only one who is writing the curriculum. You're not the only one who gets to decide what is involved in the curriculum. And that might be scary, but I have found that it's incredibly enriching and rewarding. And when you see what your students create and what they produce, it simply will blow your mind. So. How do we do this? Well, one of the ways we can do this is when I try to break up bigger groups into smaller learning groups. So one of the things I do is I have peer groups. And, and I try in every single forum, including Moodle, we, we, I recently was uh, teaching with INTEF, and we were in Moodle, and so we broke them up in groups of 30, okay? It's not enough uh, 200. We had different teachers who moderated that, those groups. But it's not enough that we say, okay, you're in a group of four, you're in a group of ten, you're in a group of five. They have to, you actually have to get them to collaborate and to learn about each other and develop relationships with each other. And that involves icebreakers and developing um, different opportunities for them to learn from each other. So one of the things that we did with our um, MOOC, um, with our crafting the e-perfect textbook is we got them to do the hangouts. Um, we're encouraging them to do that, to peer edit. And when they, when you have um, those students that step up to the challenge and begin to be the leaders, and I make it available for anyone to be a peer group leader, um, you need to congratulate them and pat them in the back a lot. You really need to support them. It, the statistics say that if you get seven very active participants in your group, that your community will really begin to develop and grow. You'll see discussions happen, and that's kind of what I've seen. Last week, my mother um, uh, was in the hospital, and so it's very difficult for me to go in and uh, really learn, uh, really provide um, feedback to to my students and I thought oh no they're just gonna fall apart without my feedback and because we had this is now the fourth week and so last week was the third week of instruction and but because we had built these opportunities we had done pedagogy we had gotten them to do an icebreaker a three to one icebreaker and get to know each other uh, because we had done that uh, for each other they started leaving um, peer feedback and they started looking at their assignments. And they were leaving in-depth things. So I was really proud of them because they ran the community. They ran the learning. And the learning continued without me. So I think it's really important that we give them those opportunities. So when you're doing those opportunities, it's important you find the right tools. 
uh, when I'm teaching my teachers on Moodle, I, I work with uh, teachers who are extremely new to technology. And this is something to consider. You have to know your audience. You have to know what is the, what are their challenges and what they're going to be able to take on. When we one of the things that we want to do is we wanted them to have bookmarking, social bookmarking together. So that way, all of them. Oh, my mom's doing better now. So thank you a lot. Better. <laughs> um, so. There's different types of social bookmarking tools out there. For our Moodle teachers, because they uh, had pretty much zero experience with technology other than using a computer, but they had an integrated digital, the course is digital storytelling. And so for those teachers, um, we decided this is Listly. This is one of my favorite bookmarking tools. It can look a lot like Pinterest. One of the reasons I like Listly, open online course, a MOOC than uh, 500, 1,000. Listly allows anyone to go and add to my list. Now, that means I have to moderate every once in a while. But this is OK for me, because that's a lot easier to do than adding 1,000 people on um, a list. And that's something you have to do when you work with other social bookmarking tools. Now, with social book those of you who might be um, new to this, what it means that all of um, the people in the course get to contribute and add resources so everyone has this available even after the course so they can continue their learning. But also, this becomes the readings. This is what they get to. And what I do is there's usually like 50, 100, but they get to scroll down. They get to scan really fast. And I tell them to choose. They can choose three or two or five of the readings that they want to scan. And then they can add that to the discussion, integrate when they're doing presentations and things like that. So they get a choice. They get the opportunity. And it could be something that they uh, do it as well. No, I didn't make this from SCORM. These are tools that we have outside. But one of the reasons, um, one of the things we did with our teachers, we didn't use Listly. We used Pinterest. And the reason we did that was because we thought that um, a majority of learners would be familiar with Pinterest. Now, my students, they were teacher students, exactly. They are uh, teacher students. They didn't even know Pinterest. They had a really tough time with Pinterest, too. So it was a good choice for us to make that choice because even though Listly would have been my option, when we talked about it, um, Pinterest was challenging, then a lot of other things would have been a lot more challenging. So I'm glad that they were able to learn how to use Pinterest and we had those collaborative boards. And you can use other collaborative tools to kind of do things as well, to collect work. And these would be tools that would be outside. Or Moodle has um, this option where you can put a link and you can actually embed the link. Now, when you're using these tools, sometimes you have to go outside the forum because um, some of their internet access isn't able to handle that. So when you do have something like Listly and everything like that, um, what we did was we also shared things on Twitter. We had a hashtag. And then all of that came up on our Twitter feed on the side column because you can have that in Moodle. You can have where if you have a hashtag, then all the resources you share with that hashtag, even your students, will come up with that. So um, you can see that. But one of the, a lot of times what we did was um, when we had them do their projects, we would use things like Linolet, Padlet, so that way they could carry things outside the course as well. Some of you might not have that option. Um, your, your, your instructors might say that you don't have that option. So that is something to consider as well. Um, OK, so now we get to being an individual. An indivi how do you uh, diversify instruction and differentiate action? online. And it's important that we do do that because we want our students not to feel like they're any number. And that's really difficult when you're teaching 500, 100, even 40. Um, you want to give them the opportunities to be able to have their shining moment in the class. 
because we want in the colon, we want them to take um, charge of their learning as well. So in order to do that, you have to have different types of icebreakers to where they get to know each other. And this is really important because when you want them to work in groups and you want them to produce their best work, and you want them to stay with the course. So some of your courses, you may only give certificate of attendance, um, or you may only be able to give certificates of achievement. But a lot of times, these courses, um, their certificates aren't going to be accepted in their jobs, or it's not going to be accepted for, or for their professional learning, whatever path they're going. So if, if that's going to be the case, if you're going to give them a certificate, but it's, you know that in some cases it's not going to count, one of the, the struggles and the main problem that students have is participating in an online course. They don't have a lot of motivation. So it's important at the beginning you do these icebreakers and get them to feel like these are their friends. They're having this experience. Why would they leave your course? They love it. They're having fun. So you you do these icebreakers throughout so that we can motivate them. And when they're motivated, they're going to to I have gotten students to do so much in such a long period of time. Um, for CO14, you'll see um, some of the student feedback folios and what they said. They said it was a struggle, it was a challenge. But in the end, I feel like I had a, I'm had a better teacher. And I feel like I've grown so much. And when you get that kind of feedback, it's just simply amazing. So we have a 3 to one introduction. And we allow students to choose any of the online tools, whether it be a poster tool or a video tool, Animoto, VoiceThread. And they have to tell us three things we should know about them, two places they love to visit, and a job they wish they had. And you can do this with any uh, age group and learner. So this is just uh, some of the ones that we had in our recent, um, in our recent crafting the ePerfect. Uh, we had videos, we had haiku decks, we had posters, we had comics, we had infographics, we had story bird books, we had so many different ones. And one of the great things is when you give them the tool, so it is not the tool that's the most important. Sometimes we learn about a tool and we think, wow, we want all our students to make animotos. But sometimes you can just give them a, the assignment. The assignment and the mission and the objective is the most important. And allow them to choose. Allow them to make those individual choices. Because then they feel like they contributed, got to introduce you to a new tool. And they're very excited to do that. So when you have the opportunity, allow your students to use tools um, that are not necessarily, don't pick them to just one or two or three tools. Another way that we try to develop relationships is that we produced a participant map. This is a thing link. I love thing link. It's a great tool. Um, by the way, the tools that I share are all free. So when you look at the different types of um, tools here, they're free. I believe in free because teachers don't have a lot of money. We don't make a lot of money. so. Um, it's important we get really fantastic tools that are cheap and or free. <laughs> um, so I like ThingLink because it has this option. Um, the option is that your students, if you make it open anyone, they can put um, a dot and they can add a video. And as soon as you scroll over, they're up and you can watch it right there. They can even put audio they, with their SoundCloud. They have a SoundCloud account. Or they can just write text. They can, they can edit it. They can put their Twitter. They can put hearts. They can do some. So our 500 participants, you can see how many went and filled this out. So here is a great representation of how many people completed this task, which is a lot of people. When you think about it, that's, that's kind of phenomenal that a lot of them be able to do this. Because in, in a lot of online courses, it, you're lucky if you get 10% participate in your task. And that's something that you have to consider because motivation for learning online is, is very, very low. 
And that's why it's important that not only do we challenge our students, and when you take a course with me, when you go through any kind of um, instruction, you work a lot. You are creating stories. You are creating guides. You are, it's, but it's fun stuff. And, and I allow a lot of playing. Um, and I allow a lot of choices. But I have found that my students will go the extra mile. They'll work harder. They'll produce better things. They'll do phenomenal things because they enjoy the experience and because they allow them the opportunity to play. So how do we play online? Well, one of the ways is first we need to brainstorm. It's really important that we have our students learn the process of how the brain works and learn in this type of way. Reading large amount of text is, is not brain friendly. Um, as things like um, cognitive maps and mind mapping. and You can even mind map. You can mind map here in Moise IQ. We could set up a blank board and I could put a little box and I could put a theme and all of you could come and you could just add to it and we would have co-learning. We would all have produced this content that we study from and then also we would have brainstormed and that's brain friendly because we are um, participating in Vygotsky's um, cognitive learning there as well. And one of the best tools I think for this if you can put it outside is Poplet. Uh, Poplet is uh, a mind mapping tool and uh, you can have it also um, it's a free app as well. what's my so I have this iPad mini and you can get it on here too the great thing about it is your students can draw they can search for pictures it'll it automatically will let them search for YouTube and Flickr pictures that they can add to their mind map they can also add text um, and they can make it look different ways they can add links as well so it you can embed this. You can actually embed this um, in a wiki. You can embed it in different types of platforms. So if you're teaching, for example, um, an Edmodo, or you have a blog or a wiki, then you can, or a Google site, or a Wix, or any of these kind of platforms, you can embed this. So after they finish creating it, they can see that it's online. You can do different things with this. You can you can gather vocabulary throughout. You can make one for each topic. You can use pre-learning tasks. How do we introduce the topic? When I teach, I, I like to brainstorm a lot. Um, in our course right now, we're doing a lot of mind mapping as well. And you can choose different tools for that. As I said, you can even do it within the platform as well when you have um, different tools like, like WizIQ, um, you can use that as well. Uh, so this is how they can contribute. Uh, and you can see here the different options. They can even post something from Facebook. They can take a picture and they can uh, post it there as well. Uh, but it's a great way to uh, tie things together and also contribute to their development. Voice thread. Voice thread is another nice option. So some of the students created voice threads for the discussions. And the great thing about voice thread is that they're able to see different sources and links, and they're also able to doodle. Uh, and and they can add voice or video comments as well. It's also a free app. So when I use tools, I try to use tools that are available online in the browser and then some that are also with apps as well. So I think um, those that's really important uh, when you give your students the opportunity if they're more advanced that they can do that. So here are a few ideas when you're working with tools like this where it's collaborative and you'll notice that with all of these tools everyone in the class can participate. Everyone in the class can add to it. And when they add to it, we learn from them. And that's idea. So I'm not showing you tools like, I really love other tools. I do love Storybird. I do. But when I, or, or these other tools like Animotos and things like that. And we do, I do a lot of students use those for their individual assignments when they're giving presentations. When they read a topic or they learn something and then they show it. Um, but I want them to be able to see and learn from each other. And so a lot of times I use these collaborative tools uh, to run most of the work.
you, they can peer edit, they can debate issues, they can do collaborative stories. So there's so many different options and available. Like, there's, there's, don't worry if you're missing anything. Um, your students can create games and quizzes for each other. So that's another way of playing as well, but it's the critical thinking. It goes back to they worked hard, but they played hard. And the way they can do that is instead of you making all of the assessments, you can have your students create assessments with what they learn. And we know that through teaching, they'll learn more because now they're the teachers. And then they can pass on these games or quizzes onto another student and that's what I have them do. I have them pass it on and then that student has to take either a snapshot or a photo or they have to fill in um, whatever score that they got and, and so that ends up being their grade. Now sometimes teachers ask me, they say well can't they cheat and can't they keep doing the quiz again until um, they get all the answers right? Yes, they can do that but that's not a problem. If my student tries to do a quiz or a test a hundred times till they get it right, be good. I want them to do that. I want them to keep trying until they get things right. So if they're smart enough to do that, then that's fine with me. Another thing Dr. Seuss says is he likes ants. It wakes up the brain cells. Um, and usually you would see go my pug here, but he's he's kind of banned because he's being a bit naughty. Uh, right now, but he might come later. Um, um, but I really like this. He says, fantasy is a necessary ingredient in living. And in online world, you can have this type of fantasy. You can have your students um, be immersed in what they like to do. And so there's so many different types of tools out there that your students, you know, if they like to listen to music and things like that, you can consider having them learn through these different types of options, like lyrics training. Um, that's one of the options. So I'm kind of going through these really quick. Uh, but don't worry about it because it's kind of like when I present to you when you're learning, and you'll learn this um, with, with students in particular, all of us come from different types of backgrounds. We're from different countries. You have different situations. And I've worked with different situations. I've worked with students who had nothing except their cell phone. So I worked with refugees who only had a cell phone, and that's all they could learn with. They, it wasn't connected to the internet. It, it didn't do much. Um, but they could still text with it. They could still record audio. There's a lot of things they could do with their cell phone. Um, they wore the same clothes when they came, and these were my language learners um, every day, and, and so we were teaching them. They were refugees from Sudan, and I worked with iPads. Every single student has an iPad. You know your situation, so what I want you to do is don't get overwhelmed by everything. What I want you to do is treat it like a buffet. Here's a feast of all of these ideas, these tools, which ever kind of ones that jump out at you, like when you go to a buffet and you see all of these nice options and you say, oh, I want to eat that one and that one. You make three or four choices and put it on a plate because those are what you want to try because you know if you try to eat everything, you're going to get full and you're going to get really sick. So what I want you to do is just take a few, take three, two or three ideas and try that. You can always come back more for the buffet and grab another plate if those don't work for you. But the idea is to try one of these ideas. That's what I want you to, I want to encourage you to do. Um, so Go Animate is another one. You can have your students work together in peer um, together and they can create these um, text-to-speech types of videos. So the, there's a lot of different ones. Um, you can have it to where you design your instruction differently. So let's say that you want to get your students to write, or let's say you want them to participate in different types of discussion. Well, one of the ways that you can encourage discussion is put it in a comment. Try d your students are used to forums. They're used to big, long text. A bit. If you give them something that's interesting and visually pleasing to look at, they're going to fill them out and, and they're going to have fun with it and they're going to try more. Um, and so something like, uh, uh, Danadel, you said that your problem is your students don't know English. 
comics and visuals like this, cognitive maps, make it so much easier for language learners. Um, they're able to see it, and they're chunking. You're chunking the vocabulary in the language, and so they're and they're able to see uh, what it's about because of the pictures. So you can you can put your discussions this way. Um, Make believe comics has over 300, and you can create your own. You can make up your own. You can add very little text. Um, so next time you have a discussion or something like that, and you want them to some writing, then try one of these and see if that helps them out as well. Um, I've worked with learners from two years old to 80 years old. Uh, so I've worked with all kinds of learners. But you might think that comics aren't something for adults, but you would be really surprised because a lot of adults, I don't, I, Helena, what is that based on? Um, because when I've worked with adults, they really enjoy this. Um, and right now, there even there's um, Nick is doing his PhD in Colombia, and it's all in comic form. Uh, we have Batman. A lot of your students have super. Heroes and things like that that they have uh, that they've read. Comics are a higher level. You can go uh, with graphic novels and even things like that, and it's higher level reading. Um, and so I think a lot of times we assume our students don't like this, um, but they. But our, my experience has been that my students have really enjoyed this. Um, and it's not something that you do all the time, but it's something that they can do. Um, and, and it is something that they can do every once in a while. Um, so there's different types of tools out there that you can use for your students to actually create their own comics as well. And one of the things that I had my students do was I had my teachers, um, they had to take a, a, an assignment, a reading, uh, like from um, an article or even Jane Eyre or, or Pride and Prejudice in, in Shakespeare had to recreate a scene of it into comic form. And so what they did was they did something like this. So this was one of my um, teachers from Spain, and this is what she created from Pride and Prejudice um, using the Pixton. So I gave them a variety of different comics that they could choose from. And so you can see how she translated this. And she ended up doing it for actually many different types of chapters. And the great thing about it is now other teachers can go and they can use this to teach with their stu um, their students. And and when you your students the, think about learning and they have to read something, um, a lot of times that they, they saw the book Pride and Prejudice. Um, they would not want to. They would not want to read it, or they might see all the words and they might be turned off from the assignment. But if you show it like this, and you can see that she did a fantastic job of translating it, um, then students are more interested to really look at look at that. So even if you do a comic to introduce a difficult reading or a difficult article that you have chosen for your learners. This helps them. And one of the things I like to get my students, even when I'm working with students and even um, adult students, is for them to take that reading or that article and to produce a comic with it. Because translating and summarizing that information, taking the information from an article or a long reading and putting it into comic form is critical thinking and it's really a tough thing to do so you're really tapping into um, a lot of different skills that they don't necessarily use and they can make larger pieces of work or as a class you can make larger pieces of work you can create graphic novels together and there's um, free tools for that as well so you can do something more in depth and a lot of us think also with college students and with adults that this isn't going to work but you know in Japanese culture been teaching their students a lot of people read graphic novels they read them in the sense and do for years they have um, Shakespeare in graphic novel form they have and that's kind of a way of life it's their kind of culture and it's easier for them to process that information and it's actually more brain friendly um, so these are ideas that I actually got from 
um, from um, different types of cultures that they saw as well and what they do with their learners. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of rush through these because we're getting to the last portion of our uh, presentation. I know it's not so sorry about that. <laughs> And I wonder if I even, yeah, okay, good. That wasn't mine. <laughs> um, so some more ways to tell stories. And for me, these tools, yeah, you can use them a lot with young learners as well and teenagers, and they seem to work more with them as well. Um, so that is a good point. Dr. She says in his book, I Can Read My Eyes Shut, the more that you learn, the more places you'll go. So that's what I want to encourage you to do, to be really open to learning from others as well. Um, you're in this opportunity to learn from different Moodle Mood centers, and when you look at what they're doing, consider to it. So how do you decide on the tool? So I showed you a lot of tools, and you know your assignments, and you know your tasks. So once you know your assignments and tasks, the idea is you have to get it to where it translates well online. So how are you going to do that? For example, you have a reading, right? So the reading, you what can you do? You can put it in comic form. I just told you that. You can do it in, um, you can have it to where they can listen to it in a podcast. You can have it to where they see a PowerPoint presentation. So you can do so much with that reading. There's so many different things. You could do a gap fill. You can have a forum discussion. You can decide on a tool and a task. Well, when you're deciding on a tool and a task, you want to do it where it's not just something where it's multiple choice, um, where it's just where they can give one answer. But you want them to be able to discuss, elaborate, and really reflect on the assignment. How do you choose a tool? Well, there's different options. Uh, one of the things I really love about um, this is materials, and they work with digital blooms. Um, it's Bloom's Taxonomy. And what they've done is that they put the different types, um, create, evaluate, analyze, apply, understand, which goes back to your objectives. So you can you can say, well, in this task, they're going to analyze, and then they're going to apply, or they're going to create, or they're going to remember, and that's what the task involves. Kay Tinkley, if you go to ilearntechnology.com, she has this live binder, and I'll, I'll give you all the resources at the end. But what they can do is they can come and they can you can click on any of these, and you can find tools to do any of these tasks. So Kelly is one of the blogs I follow, ilearntechnology.com. Every day she gives you a new free tool, and she gives you lesson ideas. She tells you this is how you can use it for learning online. And EdShelf. EdShelf is one of the the best tools that you so if you walk away and you're only taking three things on your plate. EdShelf is one of those you want to take. It's like a Google search for your um, for for web tool for free tools. Even apps. It has teacher reviews. You you type in the search and you say I'm teaching 15 year olds and they're, they're language learners and I want them to create a story and it'll give you two or three tools because you put in that search option. Now if you just say something like that then, then that's what you, um, you can decide and then it'll give you all the tools that are available for that. You can even say I'm teaching with Chrome, teaching with Android, I'm teaching with iPad and it'll give you I'm teaching on the web or I have to teach offline and it'll give you tools that match those criteria. Another really great resource out there is ideas to inspire.co.uk. And what happened, yeah, it is a one stop shot at shelf. So if you leave with anything, then remember edshelf.com because it's one of the most important things to remember. <laughs> um, with ideas to inspire.co, uh, one of the great things about it is teachers have gone together in Google Docs, and I believe it, Tom Barrett's the one who who started this, and he got teachers to go together and each add an idea of how they learn or how they use a tool. So, for example, you may have heard of Wordle. Have you? Wordle is a word cloud tool. 
And so he has a Google presentation he puts, and it says interesting ways to use Wordle, like 75 or, you know. And he invites you to this presentation because you can do it with Google Presentation. And so teachers add that I use Wordle uh, to introduce a reading. Or I use Wordle so that way they can pick out words, story. Uh, I use Wordles for them to introduce themselves. So the teachers add ideas and then it becomes collaborative. You can find all of those presentations for any kind of tool that you want to learn about. So let's say that your, your newest tool that they give you is an iPad and all of a sudden your trainer, your director says you have to use this tool to teach. Then you can use um, ideas to inspire because it's going to have a hundred ways to use an iPad. Um, or if it's even something like a whiteboard. One of the most important things is that your learners believe um, that they want to come back to the learning. And, and I think that a lot of times, even with adults, um, it's really important um, that we have our students feel like the learning was challenging, but at the same time it was an adventure because that's what learning is. And for us, even as teachers, we're, diff we're also guilty of this, where when something seems so hard, we don't want to do it. We don't want to learn about new technologies. We don't want to spend the time. We don't want to do a lot of different things. And one of the reasons we don't want to do is because we think, ah, my brain hurts. Your brain's supposed to hurt with good learning. Learning is an adventure, and if we want to carry our students into that adventure, we have to let them know, yeah, you know, what do you do with an adventure? You you back and you, you put all these things together, think you'll need, but a lot of times you'll go to different types. It'll lead you different ways that you never thought of. Um, but while you're there, you have fun, and, and you continue the learning because you feel motivated and you have this intrinsic, um, you, you associate something intrinsic with it. And so for your teaching, whatever you decide to produce, look at it and really decide, is this, is this learning going to be fun? One of the things I like to use in Moodle a lot is I like to use um, their, in, their activities and, and their um, where it's a rubric because I really think that that grading with rubric and task-based assignments with rubrics is much better than giving them a quiz because at the end of the day they don't really like a quiz they don't remember so much about the quiz uh, so when I have them do the quizzes um, then what they do is is they can do that on their own time um, because the quiz isn't going to spur them anything more you don't take a quiz and then after you get your grade, you say, oh, I'm going to study this some more. You don't. But if I were to give you a game, and you were uh, going to learn math, and you played an online game, then you would keep playing the game. You would want to go through the missions and the tasks, and you would spend more time on that, and you would reflect on that more. Or if I told you we're going to do digital storytelling, we're going to take a, a, a word problem, and you're going to make a root you're going to visualize this word problem. You're going to make a video that shows uh, tr the train went from um, London to to reading. And, you know, so that's what you have to think about when you design tasks. Are you doing it just so you can get them grades, or are you designing tasks that are really going to challenge them, but be an adventure and fun? Um, I think that's something that we really have to consider. So how do I do this? One of the ways that they do this is in my Moodle, um, when I give them assignments, this is what it kind of looks like. I put the task. The task is, for example, create a comic summarizing your feelings um, after two weeks of taking the course. That goes back to tying in the nonsense because I want them to feel, okay, I can get up stuff now. And my teachers, it was really funny because they made a comic. Um, uh, they they made a comic, and and in their comics they were saying things like, "Oh, Pinterest," and they were talking, they're complaining about Pinterest and about me getting them on Twitter. One of them even put herself as a bird, and she said, "Oh, I don't even know who I am. 
I'm a bird now. I tweet so much. So it's really, I, really funny. And so what I, I have done is I have created digital sandboxes. And I use this for every online platform that I teach with. You can actually embed this in Moodle. So I embedded this in Moodle. There's Symbaloos. I used a tool called Symbaloo. Um, this, you can use my Symbaloos. Um, you can even embed mine. So if you want to use the tools that I have, you don't have to invent the wheel. You don't even have to. Uh, um, you, you don't have to do this. I can do it for you. And so what they do is um, I put use any of the tools in the digital sandbox to complete this task. And then post your task to, um, at the time, I had Tumblr, but we didn't use Tumblr. We actually had them submitted through the database. Um, so what I did was then they had the opportunity to click on any of these, and it took them to that tool. If they didn't like that tool, then they would just go back and they would use another one. So this is a way, if you think of a sandbox, kids go in a sandbox and they get to experiment with it the way they want to experiment. They go in, they take the sand, they'll take a pal, and they'll put sand in it, and they'll make castles, and some of them will make turtles, and some of them will pretend it's, it's, it's mud. So it's a visual sandbox, and it really gets them to experiment and play with the different types of tools. Um, and how do I grade this? I grade this with the rubric, the rubric that's on the actual Moodle. Um, and they have, they have uh, uh, from um, approaching mastery. Um, and then I leave them the score, one through four, and I put a little bit of feedback. I say, I re and, and then one of those parts in the rubric is mechanics. It is something like, um, did you, and it's also visual design and stuff. Um, uh, did they have enough space and different things like that? So I think that that's the way I prefer uh, to give text. When you're we're deciding to teach online, a lot of times we complicate things. A lot of times we think, wow, it has to do this and we have to do that. I remember when I was working with Moodle and I, I used the um, EXE. That's kind of, I we use that instead of SCORE. I don't know if it's necessarily easier, but it's what I was required to use. And I had to create an ebook on this. Uh, yes, I'll do that. I'll, in fact, you, I'll give you the access to this. Um, you can download all of this. Um, I'll have that, and I'll even have all of the bookmarks and everything. So you'll get everything, <laughs> and it'll be for free. Um, and and one of the things is they made it. I felt it was very complicated. Um, it took me a long time. I had to create these ebooks with the EXE, and they had to flip, and, and it took hours. I literally didn't sleep much for three months when I was doing this. And the easier thing that would have been better is to make a PDF or to make my own um, using one of the tools and use the link, uh, because you do have that embedded link where it'll just pop up. And, and so when you're thinking, a lot of times we want to use the SCORM. A lot of times we want to use the database. A lot of times we want to use all of these different options in Moodle. But sometimes we just got to keep it simple uh, because then we're going to get frustrated. And then we are not going to want to create the, we're going to get burnt out. Uh, so it's really important um, that we, we challenge ourselves a little and try different things, but we don't want to make it too complicated. We don't want to take on too much. I try to do everything on Google um, when I'm making all of my course design because a lot of times in, in Moodle, you can save it as PDFs, uh, but I create everything on a Google Doc. I just find it easier. And then I copy and paste. Um, so I have all my rubrics still. I have, because you can save it as PDFs and everything. And then I can upload it um, as well. So I do everything. Probably I have a copy of everything. Because working on the different Moodle platforms, a lot of times my, um, the ones who I work with, whoever my boss is or my, um, who, you know, at the time. When that course closes, I don't have access to that course anymore. So I think it's really important that I, I, I do this and, and, and then I can copy paste. And I find it easier to design things off of Moodle. I find Moodle very complicated. So um, 
Oh, thank you. So Nelly says Google Drive is integrated on Moodle. Um, so I think it's easier, and it saves me so much time. So don't don't let the platform dictate to you how you design things. Um, take it simple. What if you work fast in Microsoft Word? Then then do it in Word, and then copy and paste all of that because it's going to save you time. If you just find it so complicated and you you think I'm not going to be able to do this, in part is that it's designed well in the end on Moodle, but when you're preparing things, then you don't have to do it that way. You can you can do it a way that's easier and works with the way that you are used to learning as well. I think that's really important. Um, and so this is what my Google Drive looks like. I do everything in Google Drive. I make presentations, everything. But the really great thing about it is once I've done that, I use that same rubric again and again and again. I make little adaptions. I use the same um, ebooks. I use the same uh, evaluation forms, handouts, instructions, all of that. I use it again and again and again, and I just change it. That's all I do. So um, I really, really, really like that option as well. With since it's integrated with Google Drive, you know you can leave voice feedback now on these options. So if you somebody said that rubrics are terrible, uh, Maria Sol, you might try doing Kaizena. Um, Kaizena, it's a free app, and so you can get these free apps if you go to Create here on your Google Drive, and then it's gonna pop up with all these apps. Look for Kaizena, and then. Um, after you uh, put like, Kaizena in there, then one of the things you do is you can right click and you can choose the option to open with Kaizena. So you have to actually click on it and right click. So it's just not going to come up automatically. You have to. And then put open with and then you can use it. Um, all the ones. You see how I have move note too? Somebody said move note. And what does it do? Wow, one of the great things that it does is it allows you to open the doc like this and then what it allows you to do is leave a voice comment and highlight so when they do things like um, they're working with essays then you can actually give them voice comments on their essay you can highlight it and say uh, you're tense here um, or you need to support your opinion more or I'm not really understanding what your um, trying to describe here and so you can do that as well um, and then Helena and some others are saying move note is a really good tool as well so you can do a lot more with Google Drive and I prefer to actually create things with Google and then add that to the Moodle than using the Moodle tools because I find a lot of them like the survey and the forms I do find them really difficult they take too long to grade with um, and this is what you can do with rubrics, which is a script in there. See how you can add to this. I can add comments. It automatically pops out in all of their tasks. If they put all their tasks like that, then that's what I can do. I can click on, because I have a rubric, I just click on their assignment. See, it says Project Jenny. And then whatever the elements I put on it, it's the same rubric. And it, I only design one rubric, pops up and leaves me to score every single student and not only does it do that not only does it allow me to do scores and comments it automatically emails every student afterwards I don't even have to go and email it all I have to do is fill it out write the comment and it sends it for me for all the students that I finish with that saves me so much time that literally saves me hours of work so um, I really enjoy that as well Blooperoo does the same thing if you have a quiz if you do have a quiz that they fill out A B C or it's a multiple choice test um, okay to get goop bricks and all of that you just go to you dot a upd.org and I am going to give you um, money to all of this um, I'm going to give you 
basically um, where I've curated all of these tools. Okay, so you can always come back and you can you can go and you can you can find these as well. And they're all free, by the way. So this one allows you to send a test or a quiz. So let's say you're doing something where you want to um, do something like you want to do. Um, a, a, a test that's very similar to one they're going to take, like maybe they're going to um, do where they have to do listening or anything like that. Well, if as long as there's one answer, it's a multiple for them, you don't have to grade it. It's sort of like having one of those scanning docs where you feed it in like a Scantron and it it, it goes over here and it, what it does is it ends up grading it all for you in the Scantron, that's what Fluberu is. It's an online Scantron. It just automatically does it for you. And after it does it for you, it emails all the students their grade individually. Um, so it has those kind of features. It, it gives you so much. Um, it, it saves you a lot of time. So a lot of these you're going to find in um, the Dr. Seuss. <laughs> um, and you can find this in my Pearl Tree. So my Pearl Tree is a mind map. I know it was a lot to, to look at right now. But what I really want you to walk away with is, is the way you design tasks um, and, and the way that you, you work with your design um, to make sure you don't overwhelm yourself. Get your students to do a lot of the work as well. You can use the same rubrics. You get. One of the reasons I do like rubrics and stuff is because then it, it allows me to use it year after year. I use a lot of storyboarding, same kind of storyboards, and I just make little small adaptations so I can use it again in the courses. And the students really enjoy these different types of tasks. And you can get students to have fun. You can get them to create. A more important you can get them to feel like it's just not a lecture. So like something here is more like a lecture. Um, I know. Um, most, uh, most of the comments I get, Maria, saw is that people overwhelm. Um, so like I said, it's like a buffet. Get two or three. That's it. Two or three. Take the rest out. Just get two or three that you got really excited about that you said, wow, I really love that. And work with those. And that's it, okay? And then you can always come back and you can get more from this buffet, okay? There is a recording, so then you can always go back to the recording. And finally, Dr. Seuss says you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself, you steer yourself in any direction you choose. You know what you know. So in other words, this presentation isn't a prescription. It's not to say that I'm not in your classroom and I'm not with your students. You know what you know. You know your students well and you know what you can work with. You know what your institute is going to tell you to do. They're going to, you know, whether you have to make SCORM forms or whether you know what you have to work with. And you, so you are the one who will decide where to go. But decide on something. Take a risk. Um, challenge yourself. Take one idea from this presentation. Work with. Allow your students to have that opportunity, at least one opportunity, where they get to contribute content. Because once they contribute the content and you use that for their learning, then they feel like they actually got to make choices about their learning. And so many times as teachers, we don't give them that opportunity to be able to show us what they can do. And that's really what they want. They want us to say, congratulations, you did a great job, or wow, that was really awesome. And we really enjoyed what you, the story you produced, or we really enjoyed um, you know, that you shared these resources, or thank you for this and that. And your students are going to are really appreciate you. And if it is something where they're going to tell other students, at the end of my uh, Moodle course, my teachers, who at the beginning, a lot of them told me, in fact, some of them um, dropped out of the course in the beginning because they said it was too challenging. But the ones who stuck in and did it, they said, we're going to tell every single teacher in our institute they have course because it is the best course we've ever taken. So when you get feedback like that, um, because you designed your, your, your 
tasked differently, designed the learning differently, then your students are going to really want you um, as their instructor and tell others as well. So thank you so much for listening to me. You can connect with me in all of these places. Um, I usually use Skype if you are in Boxer. You can find I'm on Boxers, and I leave a lot of voice messages on Boxer. Or if you have Google Hangouts, I do do Google Hangouts. So thank you so much. And if you ever need any help, you're more than welcome to. Um, you can you can mostly reach me at Twitter. I answer things very fast on Twitter <laughs> or Facebook, and um, it'll take me a while if you get me through email. <laughs> So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shelly. That was and awesome. I think that I uh, know we do. You want to come back and say bye? You don't hear me? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thank you for inviting me. All right. Enjoy thank the rest you. of you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. What? And I'm looking can you hear me? I'm looking forward. I think she just left us. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm still here. Oh, are you still there? Because I saw black. All of a sudden I didn't see your uh, I wanted to say that it would be great. Yeah, I turned off the video. The video, okay, because that makes the sound a lot better. Uh, I wanted to thank you. And you're invited uh. to come to the course feed and respond. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions there. I think, do you know where that is? I think Thomas added the link. It's to the Moodle MOOC 3. And I recorded this for YouTube, so I'll share the link with you later on. Without the participants, it's just the um, just your voice and the slides. So thank you, thank you everybody, thank you for joining. Have a wonderful rest of the week and weekend, and we'll see you tomorrow at the next session. So it's every single day, and then we've got the weekend and uh, connecting online for 2014. So come back tomorrow for a weekend of lots of uh, fun, and Shelly's going to be there as well. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Um, uh, what was that link? Can, can, Tom, can you post that link again? Um, I think I lost it. There's a chat, so in that way I can make sure.